Our sincere thanks, and I say this on all our behalfs in the room, to 19 people on the steering committee who have worked very hard in the background to place together the programme. We have to thank 72 speakers and facilitators who in the background have been networking and having the conference calls to try and pre-wire and uh, make sure that we have some good discussion in the course of the, the day and a half. And we thank them for giving willingly of their time. I also would like to thank on our behalf Life Sciences Index, uh, Chris and Samuel and Kevin and the rest of the team behind the scenes for organizing the event. And maybe a couple of words on format. One of the few conferences where there is as much panel debate and audience interaction and uh, we want it to be as interactive as you can possibly engineer it, as controversial as you like. This is not a meeting where we're aiming to find consensus. This is a meeting where I hope that across the, the spectrum of the delegates in the room that you get some new ideas, some new sparks, some new thoughts which just maybe come out of left field and which can help you to address your own issues when you go back into, shall we say, the real world or the world outside. It's filmed for future reference and then at the end of the, the meeting, this will be on the, the website that you can actually maybe see some of tomorrow's sessions that you couldn't attend or if you have a feeling that certain of your colleagues should see parts of the interaction, feel free then to, to share that with them. Tomorrow, the meeting, this room actually splits into two, and there'll be track one and track two, and I know you've signed up for your own preferred sessions that you'd like to attend. Track one will be in one room during the whole of the day, and track two in the, the alternative room during the whole of the day, and that's uh, just the pragmatics of it all. It's your meeting. Draw breath from the, the world outside and the, the email traffic that will still come in. Put it to one side for a minute. Just take a deep breath. Sometimes we don't get enough of that in our, in our world of being able to reflect on your challenges, reflect on hopefully some of the stimuli from the speakers that will share their thoughts with you. Use the time to network across that value chain. I'm sure you're probably sitting next to somebody that's in a function that you maybe don't even know in your own company. So make sure that you use the opportunity to network well. One comment from a Harvard Business Review that I read many years ago said, a strategy of value requires you to take a different path from your competitors to achieve differentiated outcomes for your organization and your stakeholders. So again, that's why we're not going to be seeing, I don't think, consensus. It's a very complex world we live in. It will be how you translate your takeaway messages into your business model that can be part of your differentiation. So maybe just a few thoughts from 30,000 feet just to get us going. It's all too easy, and I know that quite a number of the delegates are coming from the United Kingdom, quite a few more from Europe and one or two from further afield. It can be remarkably oppressive to think that the word austerity is in the room. We know that many of the world governments are strapped for cash. We know that budgets are struggling. We know that in healthcare particularly, this is a reality, and you see it also here in the in the UK acutely. However, that does not change the fundamental principles of the societies that we live in. Healthcare demand is and always will be infinite. The seven billion or so of us that are living on the planet all have Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Once we have food in our stomach, a roof over our head, our demands for healthcare are infinite. The fact that we can't meet that infinite demand, that's part of the challenge that we have. But if you look for innovation, if you look for new ideas, I'd also put it to you that you're more likely to see some really sparkling different approaches in what we call emerging markets. That this will be as profound a leapfrogging as 
let's say, countries that moved directly to mobile telephony and did not install fixed net telephony. You transform that into uh, one of the companies I'm on the board of. We have 4,000 people in northern Kenya that we run as a team of, of people putting water filters into houses. And we don't need an HR department. We activate them through the Samsung smartphone. We pay them through the Samsung smartphone. It, it's just a different world. It's just a different way. And where there is nothing potentially to lose, it's amazing how rapid adoption can be. One of our problems in the developed societies that we think we live in is that every time someone questions the norm, we're afraid we might lose something. And so we push back. So I think we should be open to some of the, the things that are happening right around the world in healthcare provision, healthcare access, and use that maybe as part of the challenge to the status quo that we have in many of the developed world. So demand in, is infinite. The other thing that really is exciting about the world we're living in is that science is still growing exponentially. As we see whole genomic sequencing coming below $1,000, think of the transformation that that could make. $1,000 is about the break-even point when a newborn child could have their whole genomic sequence taken rather than the multiplicity of tests that are conducted today to see if they have a rare disease or to check if everything's all right. If that was in the pocket of the parents and then someone in the family takes a particular illness, mum gets breast cancer, granny gets breast cancer, you could check if the daughter's carrying BRAC1, BRAC2. There are elements that if you knew that your child was 40% more likely to get type 2 diabetes, would you pay more attention to the diet, exercise? So you can start to manage wellness. From there all the way through to how we're using new genomic sequencing within the laboratories as ways of being able to filter for toxicities. There's a, a whole enabler just out of one small statement about new genomic sequencing. Longitudinal data, outcomes. There are many of the patients around the world where you have 8, 10 or 20 years worth of longitudinal clinical data. You can almost do virtual clinical trials. You can do epidemiology. You can do <coughs> pharmacovigilance. How enabling can that be as we move forward? Patient empowerment. One third of visits to primary care physicians in the United States start with something off the internet. And if it may be more enlightening, more than 40% of patients as they come out the primary care physician's office cross-check on the internet what the doctor said. One, uh, one example, just to bring it alive, in my former role in Roche, we had a, a medical manager in the Russian Caucasus, to all intents and purposes, off planet Earth, as far as healthcare provision was concerned. Diagnosed with a rare form of cancer, networked with other patients with the same cancer, networked with the hospitals from Boston to Birmingham to Berlin, came to the informed conclusion that if she could wave a magic wand, it would be under a certain clinical trial protocol in a certain German clinic. And at that point, her employer, Roche, stepped in and we made that happen. But the moral of the story is how the world, if you don't have handcuffs to one particular insurance company or system, you can harness the data around the world, you can harness that connectivity of patients around the world and come to an informed decision of what you want done for your health. So I just see so much opportunity from the science, the, the growth in the knowledge, the empowerment of patients, the translational medical techniques that are, are now developing, that it could not be a more exciting time to be involved in the life sciences sector. And maybe the third element, which I know affects many people in the room, looking at supply chain, looking at manufacturing, of course, under those austerity cycles and under any good business practice, you're looking for operational efficiencies. Any organization that has a 10 to 12 year development cycle for new medicines and a 5 to 12 year data protection on market, 
you have to look for some way of getting economic return, but you also have to look for some ways of doing that as cost effectively as you possibly can. And of course you hear regularly these days of how to do more with less. And more with less does not always mean internal to pharma companies, but through partnerships, through networks, through CROs, through CMOs. How do you get the virtual network to operate well on your behalf and to operate efficiently? So I think if you just lift the head a little bit and say, what is it that's happening in our world? Uh, and think broader than either your company or the UK shores or wherever your home base is. And use the next day and a half to try and see how stimulating within the debate you can see direct applications into your world.